So I'm really excited to have you all here, and I'd like to just do a little uh, welcome talk to you to tell you a little bit about the school, uh, what it is, a little bit of the history of the school. I'm very, very excited to find out more about our building because it's just magical. Um, so uh, I, I really feel like we're all here because we love old things. We're all here to see here about how much about me. How much about old things as well. Um, I love old things too. I love this building. I fell in love with the building. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about what I discovered about the building um, and about the whole at that Sarah Curry. In 2001, I uh, was looking for a teaching position. So a friend of mine, I already obtained a position in another school, in the nursery school, and a friend of mine said, you should go over and visit the missionaries. I think they're looking for people. But you know what, maybe you should. It's kind of on the rocks. It might be going on the you know. So, but you go over anyway. So I came over, I came in here, and the place was in a mess. There was horrible gray carpet in here. Um, the floors were really bad. Downstairs, the ceiling was coming down, the tin ceiling was coming down. And um, they interviewed me, and they were going to pay me less than what I would have gotten at the other place. But I fell in love with this place. As soon as I walked in the door, I thought, this is a treasure that they didn't really appreciate. And when I say they didn't appreciate it, I mean there were eight children in the school at the time. The reason things had been falling apart was because of the board <coughs> mismanagement and the infighting and the lawsuits that went on. So my first board meeting that I attended, I wrote a little note to myself in my diary, put this job. Give them one year and then we <laughs> the, the board was so disruptive, the fighting was ridiculous. I went home at 10 o'clock. At 11.30, I got a phone call. They were still in the board meeting. We want to know about this. So it was very destructive, very um, micromanaging, and the place was shambles. So luckily, some local people got involved on the board. Harvey Epstein was one of them. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Herman Hewitt, also. Herman's still here. Harvey went on to great things, <laughs> you know. Um, so these people and a bunch of parents got involved. And they gave me the position and they trusted me to do what I wanted. There was no more micromanaging, no more board members coming in and moving the furniture around. And with that positive attitude, the school grew and grew and grew. So from eight children then, we have almost 100 now. Yeah. So we have uh, a twos program, threes, fours, uh, more than one class of each of those. We have after school and summer programs. And we have um, started a, an elementary school, so we have kindergarten, first, second, and up to third grade now. So <clears throat> when I got here, as I said, things were a mess. Um, even the paperwork had been sort of destroyed, gotten rid of. So it was hard to get information about what went on. There were no pictures of this wonderful lady here. This is a small uh, brochure I found. That's actually just a zero, a zero, and some zeros. Um, nobody mentioned her name. We had a street co-named after her. The more I read about this lady, and there's a brochure, I want everybody to please take a copy of it, um, that a woman uh, made, did research on her. She was, uh, she was born in Brookhaven. She came, she went up to Utica, and she organized women in Utica, probably around 1894, something like that. She, the ladies who worked in factories, she took care of her children so they could work. She came to New York in around 1895, and in 1896, she started uh, home care for children. Because I don't know if you guys know, but back then, men and women both worked in factory, worked in factories, so they needed, they would leave the children in the street, they would put them on, tie them onto balconies in the summer, uh, or lock them in the apartment during the winter. So she saw that, and she uh, realized that they needed a place to be taken care of. She took them into her apartment on Avenue C. Um, the health department, even men were very interviewing, got involved and told her that she couldn't do that, you had to have a place. So somehow she connected with um, the Hewitts, uh, the Morgans. I don't know how she found these people, and then she got this building. This building was donated to her. Wow. So uh, I, I know that we're going to hear a lot more about the building. I don't know everything there is to know about the building, but I do know that by 1901, it was, um, it had gone into, it, it was originally a one family home. This would be the, I guess, the 
the parlor. Oh, wow. uh, the Sarah Curry herself lived upstairs, but they would, they would be in the bedrooms and the servants' quarters down below was the kitchen. So she turned into nursery school, and there were 200 children a day here. I have actually little, little books, some of the books, mm -hmm. yeah, with the uh, names of all the children. I still, I still have that. Um, so she took care of all those children, and she died in 1940. And after that, it's hard to figure out what happened, but the nursery kind of went into decline. And as I said to you, by 2001, it was on the rocks. But now we're doing really, really well. And let me get a little plug in here. We need board members. I would love to have any of you who are interested in what we do here. What I do is emotional education. I've been allowed by the board to develop this program. Um, where we really uh, help children to understand, to name their feelings, share their feelings in a healthy way, and we feel that's the basis of, uh, that's a really the most important life skill a person can have. So I'm, I'm the author of three books on the subject, and uh, people around here are very uh, savvy, creative people, and you know, creative parents, and open-minded parents, and they really value a progressive education, so that's what we do here. But um, I just want to say that you know, I found these pictures of her, and I, I really felt it was my mission to get her name out there because one person, one person can make it. That one person, if she wasn't, if she hadn't done what she did, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be in this place. The hundreds and hundreds of children who've been served over the years wouldn't be served because of that one. One person can make a difference. So each one of you can make a difference in life and can make a huge difference. So join my board <laughs> and join the village preservation and uh, help us to preserve. Uh, what was the name of the school? It's uh, the name is the Little Missionary Day Nursery, and the reason it's called that, I, I, it's weird. Like, I didn't, what does that mean? She was tiny. She was like four feet something, <laughs> literally. And they called her a missionary just because she went out and took care of people. She fed the poor around here. She did a lot of good work aside from educating the children. Is it religious? You see pictures of the kids sitting around saying grace before meals. I don't think it was. I'm not sure. So uh, the name the missionary just means a good person in the community. So and her name is Sarah Curry. She was Irish, uh, Scottish. So uh, I cannot wait to hear more from Andrew Berman about our building and the community. And thank you for your great work. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for all the work you do and for hosting us here. It's very great. welcome. Um, you know, Little Missionary really speaks to exactly what we love about the neighborhood, the combination of history and good work and continuing the best of the old traditions with a very progressive, forward-looking vision. Um, and uh, that's really so much of what the East Village is, is about. Um, uh, so tonight I'm going to make a little presentation both about the East Village in general and then kind of narrowing in on the, the blocks that we're on right here, both sides of St. Mark's Place between 1st and A. And um, all of you on your chairs have a handout. Um, we have a bit of an agenda. We're actually very open about having an agenda, which is about getting people to appreciate, love, celebrate. Um, our neighborhoods, their rich history, culture, and architecture, and hopefully help preserve them. And two of the ways in which we've recently um, tried to advance that agenda is with the publication of our book, um, uh, A History of the East Village and Its Architecture, by Francis Moroni. So the first part of tonight's presentation um, is going to be from uh, that book. Um, and you can explore it further. You can purchase a copy of it. We'll get it for free online. And then at the same time, we also launched a project that was about 10 years in the making called East Village Building Blocks, completely online. And it's actually information about and the history of every single building in the entire East Village, building by building. 2,200 buildings, I think it is. Um, and it's interactive. If you, we want, you know, uh, we started with trying to establish the date of construction and the origins of every building, but we want the stories and histories right up to the present. So we want you to go online and look, both because it's enjoyable and interesting, but because you may have information about it and you can leave it in a comment. We can uh, integrate it into the um, uh, the page. So, so definitely um, both enjoy it and contribute to it. 
So, um, so this is a uh, history of East, East Village and its architecture by Francis Moroni, as you can see on the handout. Um, you can uh, access it online just at our website, gbshp.org slash Moroni. What I'm basically going to do is, um, uh, I'm going to read from the, the foreword, which I actually wrote, um, which kind of gives you a broad um, introduction. And then hopefully you'll explore the book, which goes into so much greater detail with rich stories um, about everything that I'm going to describe in these sort of very general 30,000 feet terms. So here we go. Few places in New York City, indeed in America, are as rich in history as the East Village. And that history runs deep to New York's earliest days and even before. The neighborhood contains streets that predate the Manhattan Grid, following Native American trails or Dutch colonial roads. It was home to part of the earliest settlement of free Africans in North America. Very few people know that. The very first free black settlement anywhere in North America was in this area in the southern part of Greenwich Village, um, and today what we call Soho on the Lower East Side. Um, its earliest extant buildings date to the 18th century and include the oldest site of continuous religious worship in New York. Its building stock was developed by families as venerable as the Stuyvesants and the Astors. It was home to the East River Dry Dock District, one of New York's busiest stretches of waterfront until the Erie Canal shifted the center of maritime activity to the Hudson River, making New York City the commercial capital of America. So before the Erie Canal, this neighborhood and to the south, that East River waterfront was the New York City working waterfront. And that's just the earliest chapter of, East, of the East Village story. While the neighborhood contains some of New York's most elegant and desirable homes from the first decades after American independence, of which this is one, by the way, um, several of which still stand today on places like St. Mark's Place and Second Avenue, in the 19th century, the neighborhood became one of the great portals for immigrants to America. Some of the most densely populated streets in the country, even the world, were found within its bounds. And for half and for a half century, the East Village contained the largest settlement of German speakers outside of Berlin and Vienna, whose presence is still apparent in the architecture of many of the neighborhood's tenements and institutions. Radical social movements took hold here, led by the likes of Emma Goldman and Dorothy Day. By the early 20th century, the neighborhood was part of the largest settlement of Jews in the world, and Second Avenue, the Yiddish Rialto was one of the fonts of worldwide Jewish culture and of New York popular culture. The first federally subsidized housing development in the United States was built here. After World War II, many of the first migrants from Puerto Rico to the mainland made their home here, as did many, uh, as did many Ukrainian and Polish refugees from communism. Few parts of New York could be said to so thoroughly embody the devastation and rebirth which swept, which swept through the city in the second half of the 20th century. The East Village suffered an epidemic of crime, drugs, and abandonment by both private property owners and city government. <coughs> but innovative movements took hold in the neighborhood, which reimagined its streets and its buildings as homes for a new generation of urban pioneers. In the 1960s, countercultural spaces flourished in the former ethnic performance venues, such as Andy Warhol's The Don on St. Mark's Place and Bill Graham's Fillmore East on 2nd Avenue, which had been a Yiddish theater. Radical new forms of urban homesteading were established by Charas El Bohio at the former PS64 and at the Liz Christie Garden, which was New York's very first community garden, as well as at squats like C Squat and the Umbrella House, where abandoned buildings and rubble strewn lots were reclaimed and new life was breathed into them. The Cooper Square Committee successfully fought off Robert Moses' urban renewal slash destruction efforts and charted a new path for adaptive reuse and non-displacement that manifests in today's fourth, fourth arts block. 
Um, not many people remember this, although some people I'm sure do, uh, but Robert Moses actually originally proposed to tear down virtually the entire East Village from 2nd Avenue to the Valley, and that's the origins of the Cooper Square Committee, which fought to um, uh, instead keep those buildings um, and maintain them as a place of uh, affordable living. Um, performance Space 122, La Mama, Anthology Film Archives and Theater for the New City took possession of formerly abandoned city-owned buildings, launching cultural entities with bold and unconventional new visions. Cultural and artistic revolutions also emanated from the East Village during this time. In the 1960s, the Hare Krishna movement and the New York chapter of the, of the Young Lords were both founded in Tompkins Square Park. In the 1970s, punk rock was born at CBGB on the Valley. In the 1980s, Club 57 and 51X on St. Mark's Place played a key role in launching the careers of artists such as Keith Perry and Jean-Michel Basquiat. The Pyramid Club on Avenue A launched a new era of politically conscious performance art, particularly drag-based performance art, giving birth to the Wigstock Festival. The East Village can even claim credit as the birthplace of the shag, of the shag haircut at Paul McGregor's Haircutters, 15 St. Mark's Place, and the happening at the Rubin Gallery uh, at 61 Force the Fourth Avenue. The legacy of this rich cultural history can still be discerned in the streets and buildings of the East Village today. Early 19th century houses remain, like the one we're in right now, though many have been altered to accommodate commerce, worship, or performance. An incredible array of civic and institutional buildings continue on, including the largest collection of CBJ Snyder schools in the city, who was one of the great innovators of uh, educational architecture and was the head of the New York City school system in the late 19th and early 20th century when these waves of immigrants were coming and also when New York City first consolidated into what used to be called Greater New York, but what is now just the five boroughs of New York City, as opposed to New York just being the borough of Manhattan. So the East Village has the largest collection of C.J. Snyder schools in, uh, in the city, and some of New York's earliest public libraries can be found in this, in this neighborhood. So the Ottendorfer here on 2nd Avenue is actually New York's oldest public library, and um, the Tompkins Square is uh, from that very, very first wave of Carnegie free libraries that were built in the early uh, 20th century. Houses of worship reflecting a kaleidoscope of ethnicities and religious denominations survive in every corner of the neighborhood, often shoehorned onto 25-foot wide lots. And of course, one of New York's most impressive and intact arrays of 19th and early 20th century tenements live on in these blocks. Some date as far back as the first half of the 19th century when this form of housing was new while many others were designed with fuller detail by some of New York's most prominent architects, including George F. Pelham and the Herder brothers. One of the things that I always find amazing about studying tenements, which we've done uh, a lot of at Village Preservation, is the exteriors can be so incredibly elaborately detailed and just so uh, rich and beautiful, though the living circumstances on the inside, especially back then, were so incredibly um, limited um, and ungenerous. Um, it's, a, it's a really incredible uh, contrast. And one of the things that you see, and uh, we'll explore building blocks, you'll be able to get a sort of little taste of this. You see over time how these buildings have been changed so that originally there were you know, no bathrooms whatsoever, then there was a single bathroom in the hallway that everybody shared, then eventually every apartment got its own bathroom and sort of a long uh, process of evolution that, um, uh, that took place. And in spite of its gritty workaday veneer, the East, Village, the East Village can also boast works by prominent architectural luminaries such as Emery Roth, James Walker, James Renwick, Calvert Box, and Ithiel Town, to name just a few. So these are some of the biggest names in architecture in the 19th and early 20th century. But make no mistake, while this rich legacy survives in the hundred odd blocks of the East Village, it is disappearing, and in some cases disappearing quickly. Over the years of the research and writing of this report, dozens of historic buildings in the neighborhood have been demolished or disfigured, including several early 19th century row houses that survived, improbably, in the easternmost regions of the neighborhood. 
So these are all buildings that we uh, fought to try to uh, keep from being demolished. Um, I don't want to only focus on the negative. We've actually been able to secure a landmark designation for 1,250 buildings between the East Village and Greenwich Village, but there's no denying that we've lost some great ones. This is 35 Cooper Square at uh, 6th Street, which was a, a 1830s house um, demolished about six or seven years ago. These, just a couple of years ago, across from Webster Hall, replaced by the Moxie Hotel. Um, the Mary Help of Christians Church, just a couple of blocks uh, away from here. The parishioners, we, many others, uh, staged a, a really spirited battle to try to save that. These beautiful, um, albeit dilapidated, uh, Greek Revival row houses that dated to the late 1830s, early 1840s, uh, similar vintage for this one here. It's a slightly later house on uh, 6th Street, all just in the last couple of years um, demolished. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's been lost in the neighborhood um, uh, recently. So, um, uh, churches and theaters, a uh, hundred years old or more, have been destroyed. And cornices, wooden and cast iron storefronts and architectural detail that survived a century or more are being ripped from buildings, leaving them a shell of their former selves. And here are just two uh, unfortunate examples. This one right around the corner from our office. Uh, this uh, formerly a house um, dated to the 1840s, 1850s. This is what it now looks like after a renovation. This one really ripped my heart. I always loved this uh, tenement on the corner of 5th Street and Avenue B for no particular reason other than to save themselves some expense. Uh, the owners just ripped that cornice uh, right off. Um, and that's the condition that they've uh, left it. Um, so, uh, finally, um, the East Village has always been a place of welcome to newcomers. But without further efforts to preserve its history, newcomers to the East Village will have no idea of and no way to appreciate the distinct and varied lives and experiences of those who came before them. Now is the time for entities like the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission to act to protect the rich confluence of social, cultural, and architectural history that is the East Village. So that, in a lot of ways, really is our underlying agenda um, of all of this. And um, in 2012, um, we were able to help advocate for the um, first large, semi-large, um, historic district in the East Village. It's called the East Village Lower East Side Historic District. It covers about 300 buildings. You know, it's maybe, uh, I guess, less than 10% of the neighborhood. Um, we're currently in the process using this report, building blocks, and some meetings we've had with the Landmarks Preservation um, seeking to get landmark protections in the neighborhood um, expanded. Um, without them, uh, we're going to see more of this, uh, we're going to see more of this, we're going to see more of this uh, disappearing. Um, and that really would be a shame because the East Village um, uh, does have this incredibly rich and special history that does span the entire history of New York, even going back to New Amsterdam. Um, you know, Peter Stuyvesant's uh, farm, um, his, uh, his chapel, they were all in this neighborhood. Um, so you really can't tell the story of New York without um, telling the story of the East Village and looking at uh, what you have here. And in many ways, the both the depths to which in some ways it sank um, and then the way in which it resurrected itself, I think also really speaks to um, the history of New York over the last um, uh, several decades. So all the more reason why it's important um, to preserve and protect all of this uh, amazing uh, history. Um, can I ask just a show of hands, how many people who are here live in the East Village? Okay, so just about everybody. Um, uh, so some of us used to. And so once <laughs> an East Villager, always an East Villager. Um, and um, uh, so part of the, um, uh, so you know, as I mentioned before, part of the reason why we, we do this is because we also want to engage people in terms of uh, getting their stories about the neighborhood. Um, but we also want to bring you to building blocks now. Here we go. So this is building blocks, or this is one of the ways in which you can access building blocks. So here we have the uh, a map of the entire um, East Village. Um, and uh, one of the easiest ways to explore is you can just go uh, and click on any block. And once you do, it'll pop up every single building on the block. You can 
uh, click on the building and get information about it. We also have a series of guided tours, so depending on what you might be interested in, you can take a tour of the neighborhood based on a, a variety of different characteristics. Lois Aida tour, so uh, focusing on the uh, Puerto Rican and Hispanic heritage, uh, Little Ukraine, LGBTQ sites, off-off-Broadway theaters, synagogues, dry dock district, master tenements, punk rock. Um, I'll show you uh, maybe one or two of them just to give you an idea of how it works. African American history. This, this one's sort of interesting because people don't typically associate the East Village that strongly with African American history, but in fact there's a lot of really incredible sites in the East Village that do relate to African American history. So one, for instance, is the Charlie Parker residence over on Avenue B, and when you go to this, um, and you click on it, um, it will... In fact, I was clicking the wrong part, my apologies. So, oops. Hmm. Which, oh, I think I know what I did. I apologize. This, uh, here we go. This old laptop is just a little one for me to navigate. So what will happen is when you click on the individual building, it will bring up the building date, it, when it's known, who the original owner or architect was. In New York City, before 1866, there wasn't a department of buildings that kept records of things like architects and owners of buildings. So oftentimes it can be a little challenging to find out some of this information. We do have it for a lot of these early buildings. In this particular case, we don't. Um, there's all sorts of uh, uh, interesting information that's attached to it. Um, that you can um, uh, also explore, including, so here, just as an example, um, this should bring up the uh, 1980s tax photo uh, for the building, so you can see what it looked like in 1980, and if it's anything like most of the uh, images in here, um, it looked probably a little less nice than it does today. This one, not so bad, obviously, it was kept in sort of relatively decent shape, but, um, I want to show you some of the other sites that are on this tour. So this one, for instance, so this um, uh, tenement here on 6th Street between uh, Bowery and 2nd Avenue was the site of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Oh, wow. And that's significant because there is a woman who you may or may not have ever heard of. Um, who, uh, who, her name was Elizabeth Jennings, and she was basically the Rosa Parks of the 19th century. She um, led a crusade uh, against the segregation of New York City streetcars in the 19th century, and she was actually successful um, in doing it. And this was in the pre-Civil War, um, and she was en route to the church, which was located here, when she was thrown off of a streetcar uh, because she didn't, uh, she wasn't willing to kind of give up her her seat um, because she was African American, um, and it was a uh, it, it sparked massive protests, etc., and did result in uh, changes in terms of the way in which New York City streetcars were operated. And this was way back in 1854. Now, of course, you never know that there was an uh, African uh, Methodist Episcopal Church that had been located on this block. Um, but that's one of the great things about the site is it, it keeps um, a lot of this kind of history alive. So let's just see what some so you know some of the other things that you'll find on here are things like um, great jazz clubs. Um, the East Village was really one of the, the wonderful centers uh, of jazz in um, in New York in the 1950s. Um, we have some sites where. Well, certainly Cooper Union um, appears very, very often um, in this. I mean, this is uh, uh, among the great um, aspects of the significance of Cooper Union. There was a lot that went on in the Great Hall in terms of the history of the struggle against uh, slavery and for uh, civil rights for African Americans. Trust me, it normally <laughs> works very well. But, you know, as some of you may know, uh, the Cooper Union, uh, the Great Hall there we are, was where, um, for instance, uh, Abraham Lincoln um, gave his uh, speech that really launched him uh, to the presidency in terms of talking about um, uh, uh, slavery, 
Um, Frederick Douglass gave a historic speech here, etc. So these are just some of the kinds of things that you can find um, in here. But now I want to take you to uh, look at our um, the block that we're actually on right now and check out some of the buildings and some of the history uh, that's here. Um, because it really is a wonderful encapsulation of the East Village. So this is the way it works. So it shows the block with a historic map uh, first, and then basically it goes down by lot number, um, which doesn't always follow a logical course. So don't get too thrown off if it jumps from one address to another, um, because these changed over time. Um, but uh, so let me just kind of give you a, a sample of, of some of what we'll find on this block. So there's a lot of buildings on the block that we're sitting on that are from the very first wave of development in this area. So in other words, these were the first buildings that were, and only buildings, that were ever built where they stand right now. So we have a lot of buildings here from the 1840s and 50s, um, even on the first, even on the avenues. Um, so, for instance, this building here, just around the corner from us on First Avenue, was built in 1849-1850. Um, and what's interesting and a little bit surprising about it is it looks as though it was actually built as a uh, tenement. And that's a little unusual. Tenements, which were multifamily housing built for working class or poor people, um, weren't typically built um, did become very common in New York until after the Civil War. There's definitely pre-Civil War um, tenements, but prior to that time, typically what happened was housing was built as houses. And if you were well-to-do enough, you owned your own house. If you weren't well-to-do enough, you boarded in a house. Um, or you rented out parts of your house. But with the Industrial Revolution and with massive immigration, um, they started to build places that were called tenant houses, eventually called tenements, uh, which meant that you didn't own it and it was built exclusively to house tenants, um, which was kind of a new concept. So the East Village actually still has some of these very, very early surviving tenements. They tend to be shorter, simpler, and look not dissimilar to a house. You'll see as time goes on, um, these tenements took on a very, very different look for a variety of reasons, and certainly um, uh, this block has a uh, whole very much. Let's see. Here's, um, I'm going to show you a house on the block that's actually still looks pretty similar to the way it was when it was uh, originally built. This one dates to 1845, so this is just around the corner on 9th Street. So you can see, and one of the ways that it's actually um, often easy to tell, it's not a 100% rule, um, whether something was built as a house or if it was built as an apartment building like this here, the houses are set back from the street and they have a little area away and a stoop. Now oftentimes the stoops are gone, but you can still tell that the building had a stoop because the way in which it's set back and because the first floor is above the street level. If you see that, that's kind of a dead giveaway that this was actually originally built as a house. Tenements do sometimes have raised first levels, more because they had um, commercial spaces at the bottom, so they were raising up so that they could get like some sort of store or factory or bakery uh, in the ground floor. But houses, like the one that we're in, basically was because you wanted to have this sort of grand entrance where you, the well-to-do person, were a little bit separated from and up above the street, and the work was done in the basement downstairs. That's where the kitchen was, that's where the, the workers were. Um, and then they slept typically in the attic on the top floor, which was a bit of a climb, a bit of a height to get to, and typically had sort of the, the lowest of ceilings. So this, um, clearly at some point it was turned into um, multifamily housing because the fire escape was added. That's why those were um, uh, added. If it was a single family house, it wouldn't need that. Um, but this is, while well, there are probably some changes, this more or less looks like what the building uh, looked like when it was built you know, 160, 170 uh, years ago, which is pretty incredible, especially since this is not part of the uh, landmark part of uh, the neighborhood. Now, here's a... Hey, could I ask a question? Sure. So, at, the, at this time, I'm trying to visualize what the whole neighborhood looked like. At this time, obviously, St. Mark's in the Bowery, the church was there. What else would have been here at that time? So, these were this, the first buildings built. Are there any other landmarks or... Uh, you know, terrain or buildings uh, that 
would complete the picture of Well, so the area? You know, originally most of the East Village was a series of farms right. which were divided up and sold right. off. Um, the neighborhood yeah. developed um, from its outer edges in. Um, the oldest parts of the neighborhood typically are closer to the Bowery or closer okay. to the waterfront. Okay. Now that said, there's been a lot of change, so especially the stuff closer to the waterfront, there's very little of that yeah. earliest stuff left, although there's some, um, and we'll uh, hopefully see a little bit of it. Um, and the, the uh, development moved inwards. So by the 1830s, 40s, 50s, most of the neighborhood was built in one form or another. And then what happened was it went from being a neighborhood that was um, for middle to upper middle class successful people. And in the case of um, around the intersection of St. Mark's Place and Second Avenue, the wealthiest people in New York, um, to being a place of the among the poorest people in New York. It changed very rapidly, which was typical of New York in the 19th century, in part because of the waves of immigration. So the houses were turned, were first chopped up and then uh, oftentimes torn down and replaced with tenements, such as uh, this one here. So this tells you a little bit about you know kind of how this happened. So this is 1887. Now the tenement that I showed you before is what was called a, a pre-law tenement. Um, and what that means is there were at the time no real laws um, that uh, regulated how you could build these buildings and what ha ha had to be in them in order to make it safe and habitable for somebody to live in. Um, by 1868, 69, I forget, I should remember what the date is, but I can't at the moment, they passed what's now referred to as the old law, it was the first tenement law, which required the most basic kinds of, of amenities. Um, and these tenements are often referred to as dumbbell tenements. And the reason why they're called dumbbell tenements is um, people often think it's because they had sort of like you know, kind of simple architecture or something like that. It's not. It's because if you were able to look at this from above, it would look like a dumbbell. It's fat at either end, and it's a little bit skinnier in the middle. And the reason why it's a little bit skinnier in the middle is because they required that there be these tiny air shafts so that there could be windows on the interior parts of the, of the building um, so that some air could get it. The problem was these shafts were typically maybe five or ten feet wide. Um, they could be five or six stories tall. Um, and more often than not, instead of uh, allowing fresh air to travel in, they would allow disease, vermin. smell, vermin, fire, sadly. Um, so they weren't really much of a benefit. What they did do was, if you look at the, the older tenements, the 1850s ones that I showed you, they don't go that deep into the um, uh, into the lot. So they typically have a nice sized backyard because basically there's windows in the front and windows in the back and that's it. These, because they have these little tiny windows in the interior, they go way, way back. Um, so they often have a rear yard of maybe like 10 feet at most. Um, but what happened over time was those those pre-law tenements, those first small ones that I showed you, they often had back houses built built behind them. So what was originally a decent-sized backyard, they ended up building another structure in the back of it, so which might then be just 10 or 15 feet from the back of the uh, of the first house. And then I'm going to show you, um, let's see, uh, the sort of final stage of tenement development, which we have some nice examples of on this block. Yeah. So this is what's called a new law tenement, which was passed, the law was passed in 1901. Um, and oh, actually, this is, this is a very, very late old law tenement. But let's look at it anyway, because it's still, uh, it tells you a lot. So as time went on, the uh, tenements got taller and taller because they were basically trying to spit more and more people uh, into it. One thing that's also interesting is we didn't look at the um, architect and builder names for some of the previous ones. But for most of the buildings that you see built in the uh, the mid uh, the second half of the 19th century, it's almost always German names um, because this was a predominantly German neighborhood. By the turn of the century, you're starting to see more uh, Jewish names. And Michael Bernstein and he, his brother, um, whose name I forget, but they had an architectural firm called Bernstein and Bernstein, um, was one of the most prolific architects anywhere in New York. 
Um, I've heard some architectural historians say that there's probably um, uh, more buildings built by the Bernsteins than any other architects in all of New York City. So the, as, the, the, as time goes on, the tenements get uh, taller. Um, they're very narrow because typically they were replacing a little house on a 25 foot wide lot but they could be one, two, three, four, five, six, plus a, a, a basement, sometimes as much as seven stories tall, um, all without elevators, um, et cetera. Um, so now, and there was a huge rush to build um, these uh, old law tenements like this one in 1900 and 1901, because in 1901, these new rules took effect um, that did actually finally require a considerable amount more of uh, light and air for um, these buildings. And so this here, built in 1904, is um, a pair of new law tenements. And new law tenements are almost always much wider. And the reason for that is because uh, the new law required a much wider clearance in terms of light and air next to every bedroom window. So if you had a narrow 25 foot lot, like the one that we just saw, you would have to behind the, so here are some of the legally required windows that you could provide. But then behind that, your building would have to be so narrow in order to provide windows that haven't had enough space next to it, that on a 25 foot wide lot, it wouldn't make any sense. You'd have like a, you'd have like a 10 foot wide building at most. So these new law tenements built after 1901 always were larger because they needed to have that extra space in order to provide. If you could look at this from overhead, you would see that there are some very large cutouts in the middle and on either side um, meant to fulfill the uh, requirements of the law. Um, so let's go back to um, St. Mark's Place and talk about this building and some of its neighbors. So we believe that the building that we're in right now is one of the very oldest, if not the oldest buildings on this block, and it's from the earliest wave of residential development in this neighborhood. So um, as was mentioned before, this was built as a very grand, actually, single family home, and it was originally built, we believe, around 1839. Um, and the way that we've estimated that is, since there's no records um, that say when things are built, the city did keep something called tax assessment records. And so what we do is we go back and we look at every year's tax assessment records for each of these lots. And when we suddenly see a big jump in the value, that tells us something got built there because all of a sudden it's being taxed at a much higher rate. And if it lines up with other things that correlate with um, what we believe is uh, makes sense as the date of construction, then that's how we um, identify when it was built. So this was built for some very successful uh, uh, family in the 18, late 1830s, and it would have only gone to up here, and then here there would have been uh, an attic story, which is where the servants would have lived. Um, our records show that probably sometime in the 18, yeah, uh, in the late 19th century, they uh, added the upper story to the building um, and uh, added this cornice that was here uh, that you see as well. So um, looking back at the permits, and let me show you how if you want to explore yourself for any of these places, you can do this. So you just click on over here, um, Department of Buildings Permits, and what will pop up is copies that we made of the original Department of Buildings Permits for this building, and what it tells us is that as late as 1886, it was still a dwelling, so it was still a residence. Um, it had, um, it referred to it as having a peaked roof, so that meant it, what, it wasn't in the form that it's in now, which is that it has a flat roof uh, currently, so if we go back and look. So in other words, in 1886, that full top story had not yet been added. Um, and uh, it does say that in, uh, uh, that in 1886, that's when the fourth story was added, so it got this flat roof. Um, and by 1910, we do see records that say that it was being used as a day nursery. And of course, the school was founded in 1897. Is that right? Um, that, that, was that was a corporation. They bought the building in 1901, though. They got this in 1901. Okay. Yeah. So you came, came here in 1901. 
personally, uh, no, the school, the school, <laughs> <laughs> school, 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 school came here in 1905, okay. yeah. Because I, I thought, not for here, but elsewhere that I've read, that it was established in 1896. That's the corporation. The corporation, yeah, yeah, yeah. there we go. Yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a little bit of detective work, but you can sort of figure some of this stuff out. Now, by the way, look at the building next to it here. Um, if you a um, much simpler, much more stripped down building, by the way, set back from the street. Looking at this building, you wouldn't probably think much of it, but if you notice the way that the windows line up at exactly the same level, that tells you something. So this was almost undoubtedly built as a house at the exact same time as this one, probably by the same developer, probably looked exactly like this one did. And in fact, the records that we found indicate a date of construction of around 1839 for this building as well. Of course, there's much less record of that uh, original history uh, left on the facade here, um, but that sort of tells you about the ways in which the neighborhood evolved. Given the way that it looks, I'm guessing that what you're seeing here probably dates to maybe the 1920s or 1930s when they often would sort of stucco over the entire um, facade of a, uh, a building. Um, I'm going to show you one or two others on this block that have some you know, a little bit of interesting quirks that tell you uh, some stuff about the neighborhood. There's this wonderful building here, um, just at the corner of uh, First Avenue, um, okay. which uses the address 85 St. Mark Place or 134, 136 First Avenue. So here's something interesting. We found that there was a building built here um, in 1841 uh, to 1843. However, as you can see, comes out to the street wall, there's really nothing about this that looks like a house. So one of two things is the case. Either we weren't able to find a record of the demolition, or what would sometimes happen is they would actually build up and out and around a house so extensively that there'd be no physical trace of the original house left that you could see on the outside. So the house might have come out to here, but they might have added on this front part, they might have built into the backyard, added on an extra story on top. So there could be an 1840s house inside of this building, um, but this alteration that we see, or what, the facade that we see dates to 1871. In fact, if you look at the cornice, it actually has the number 1871 in it, although we do actually have the uh, Department of Buildings records that show us. And if you've ever walked past this building, you might have noticed that the um, lintels over the windows have a kind of uh, rusty color to them. That's actually because they are metal, um, which was sometimes the case for these original um, uh, lintels. So they have actually rusted uh, over time, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so, um, you know, these buildings give us kind of a, a general sense of how the neighborhood evolved um, over the years. And um, let me just show you one other thing on here. And I'm happy to open it up to questions. So just uh, on the other side of Little Mish is a series of buildings that also um, are kind of in between, you know, I, I showed you the one next to Little Mish where there's like almost no record of you being able to tell that they were once. Um, so this is Little Mish over here. Um, the one over here, it's almost completely disappeared. These were not built at the same time. They're a couple years later, but they probably looked not dissimilar. And you can kind of see it a little bit. They're sort of set back from the street. They've all been combined, three of these houses into one, with this one entrance, which clearly is, does not date to the early 19th century. This is a much more modern addition. Um, and they had a full uh, fourth story and these new cornices added on top. But originally, when these were built in 1841, these would have been um, three separate houses for sort of relatively well-to-do, um, successful merchants. Um, and over the years, it would have evolved um, into multifamily housing and uh, a variety of, of other um, uses. And it's really, uh, it's nothing short of amazing that these buildings um, still survive to this, this day. Oftentimes what we're up against with the um, Landmarks Preservation Commission is because a lot of these buildings have been altered a lot, they're less interested in saying that they're worthy of preservation. From our perspective, the alterations in a lot of cases tell a lot of that history. 
They talk about how the neighborhood evolved from being a place of the well-to-do to a place of immigrants to a place of you know radical and progressive institutions that would take over these buildings and um, put them to new new use. It does make it um, challenging because one of the things that the Landmarks Preservation Commission has to do is they have to consider any application that comes to them to make a change to the building. So you know sometimes somebody will say. Uh, well, you know what, I want to I wanna restore the stoop, I want to put the stoop back. Um, and then that raises the question of, does that, is, that, is that appropriate? Should it, they be allowed to put the stoop back? Or is the fact that it was changed to this form mm -hmm. significant enough that that's not something yeah. that should be allowed? And it's a subjective question. Other times they might say, well, you know what, we want to do something innovative and different uh, uh, add up here on the cornice. And they'll say, well, look, that's what happened in the 1890s over here. You know, why can't we do sort of a modern version of that? Um, so again, there's a level of subjectivity, and I, I respect that from the commission, the more complicated it is, you know, the more the harder it is for them to do their job of regulating it. So sometimes they say, give us the simple ones that we know we can just say, we're just going to keep it exactly the way it is, and, and that's what our job is. But, you know, I do think these are important questions to grapple with, and um, I'd rather that uh, they made a decision that reasonable people could disagree about, um, but that they still said, look, we're going to at least take a look at this and try to decide what is the historically significant parts of this that we want to um, uh, hold on to. So that's basically what I wanted to show you. Um, and I want to, I guess now, just kind of turn it over for, for questions or if there's comments or anything like that. I'm also happy to um, look at some other buildings if you want to. But uh, yes? The building that I just had up, mm -hmm. um, I see this a lot, that the windows are flipped over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a question. Is that an air shaft? The decoration is still there, mm -hmm. and I don't understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Sure. So those are called blind windows, mm -hmm. and um, they're not actual windows, and they never were. Mm -hmm. so, so they are purely decorative, and they were meant to just sort of continue the rhythm of the facade. But it's not to say that you'll never ever see bricked over windows, um, but these are not. And typically, it's not a 100% rule. Um, but a, 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 what's called a blind window will always have an indentation so that it mirrors as if there were an actual window there because it's meant to sort of maintain that rhythm and sense of space. Typically when someone bricks over a window, they just do it flush and it just it doesn't look very nice. Um, every once in a while they'll brick up a window and they'll leave a little bit of a space. But, um, that just inside was bigger, but they just didn't want to put a window in there? Presumably either there's a a stairwell here, or there's something that that didn't uh, that for whatever reason they didn't want to they either didn't want to or couldn't put a window there. Um, so since they couldn't have a window and they didn't want to have a big just blank wall, they sort of pretended that they had <laughs> to sort of keep the. Uh, we get that question a lot actually, so I'm really glad you asked that. Yes. What was the start of the um, building permits? If I was here in 1840 and wanted a building building, mm -hmm. did I have to go to anybody for permission? So, you know, a lot of this stuff was completely unprofessionalized uh, until the middle or later 19th century. The Industrial Revolution, the Civil War changed a lot of this stuff. So first of all, there weren't even licensed architects for the most part until well into the 19th century. There wasn't a Department of Buildings. Um, so, you know, depending on what you were doing and what the year was, you, you might not have needed permission from anybody. It was a much simpler and different time. Um, but certainly by the mid to late 18, uh, 1800s, um, as the population of the city was exploding um, and as technology was changing, so construction meant something very different in the 1860s than it did in the 1800s, um, they did start to regulate it a lot more. And you needed, you needed building permits. There were you know, health codes. There were a variety of different things that you might have to abide by. Yes. Yeah, I'm thinking about the chronology of when buildings went up because uh, there was an empty space, obviously. Mm -hmm. But then buildings came down, and when another building would take its place, it could be sandwiched in between two other structures, which obviously means that you're restricted by how much space you have. You can't expand either left or right because there's a building there. Mm -hmm. So. 
Obviously, the architect knew that. But it just makes me wonder, because there's a lot of different uh, uh, variations of the widths of the building. Mm -hmm. And I guess when, well, I should I really don't know for sure, if a large structure goes down, that means a large space, mm -hmm. you could be replaced by a building, uh, one structure that, that fits in there, building. or it could be more than one. Mm -hmm. Sure. That is, let's say you have 75 feet. Mm -hmm. It could be three buildings or 25. Sure. Uh, and sometimes that happens, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, the basic um, sort of unit of measurement in terms of certainly at least this part of Manhattan is a typical lot is about 25 feet by 100 feet. That's on a standard size block. So a standard size block is um, 200 feet. Um, from the street to the street. So let's say from St. Mark's Place to 9th Street, the property, the two property lines are 200 feet. So that's almost always split in half, although there's sometimes variations of that. So you get 100 feet on one side, 100 feet on another. Sometimes either through acquisition or whatever else, you might have a lot that goes all the way through. So it's the full 200 feet. And typically, at least at the beginning, they started by being divided up into 25 by 25. And that was just considered the perfect size to build a, a, a house on. You had a nice backyard, you had sort of a front yard, and then over time, they got sort of mushed together, combined, although some of them are still exactly that. This is uh, about 25 feet wide, and if I had to guess, it probably goes just about halfway back down the block. It's possible that that little brown building behind it was built in what was originally the uh, backyard of the building, so it might be a little bit less than 100 feet, but typically, Either 25 by 100 or something very close to that is sort of the basic unit of measurement that they all fall into, and then it's a matter of where they, where they combine into something bigger. And every once in a while, as you described, somebody could put together a big lot, a building could come down, and you might build a series of smaller buildings on it. In New York, that's rare, but not impossible. Our trend is to, over time, build bigger and bigger, not smaller and smaller. Although there are exceptions to that, and uh, you see that a lot in the 1930s after the Depression. You see a lot of larger buildings replaced by smaller buildings. Um, and you see that in the East Village during the 70s, 80s, and 90s in some cases. A lot of times those buildings that were burnt out and vacant lots uh, you know, like those little brown brick sort of housey buildings that went up in the 90s under Giuliani that took the place of a lot of the um, uh, community gardens. Those were a lot smaller than what had been the buildings that were on um, the lot. So it, it really depends on the economics of the time. But for the most part, the trend is towards bigger, not smaller. What about the avenues, though? Mm -hmm. Is it the same um, regulation with, with the, width, the widths of the building on the avenues? So starting out the way it usually was, was on the avenue there would just be two lots. There would be the one that's over here that would go halfway through and the one that was at the other end and would go halfway through. Because the avenues often got um, uh, commercialized earlier, what might happen is that house that was here would go and they'd sell it and it would get divided up into five smaller lots where small buildings would be built. Now that's not always the case and sometimes there would be a row of houses going back on the avenue as well with a similar 25 feet by, if not 100 feet, they probably were a little less deep um, as well. But that's, uh, if you look at the historic maps, you can see that that's usually the, the pattern that everything emanates from. Yeah. We have a question about this building that's up next to PBQ. Mm -hmm. Now it's called the Illegal Bar. Mm -hmm. But it's literally, literally the smallest building I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Do you know the address? I don't know the address, but Which there's block big is buildings next to it that look like they were single family residences. Yeah, same it's same it's squeezed same in. Avenue. Next to what used to be Cafe Orlando. I think so. I think so. Really narrow. So it's tiny. Um, we actually did a whole uh, blog post about that building, <laughs> which I'm going to see if I can bring it up for you. But it's a it's a really interesting story. Um, that one, if it were its own building, it would be. You know how there's the famous uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay House in the West Village. They're yeah, yeah. referred to as the narrowest house. Yeah. Um, so this is narrower. But it's actually not its own. Let's see if we can get it this way. Um, and rather than going through the. 
That's a great title. <laughs> Is it, uh, does this look right? This one over here? Oh, no. I know it's a little hard to see, but so this is St. Mark's Place. Uh, BBQ is over here. What was Cafe Orlin was right. 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 Yeah. 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 So if you um, if you go to our website and you just do a search for uh, the narrowest house, it'll give you the whole story. <laughs> Basically, this was a uh, this was built in what had been the alleyway next to a private house to get to the rear. Um, and then they built this on there, but it was an addition to the existing house. So it's actually, it's connected to, it's part of uh, the house that's next to it right here. It's not its own um, independent building. Oh. And it was built in the 1920s or 1930s. Um, and uh, it's funny because, uh, so this is the Edna St. Vincent Malay house, nine and a half feet wide. This is only nine feet wide um, uh, in the West Village. And that similarly was a, a, a horse path um, for the house that it was next to. You no longer needed horses. The neighborhood wasn't quite so fancy as it used to be anymore. They were like, oh, let's, let's just build a skinny little uh, 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 house on there. Um, and that's how a lot of these came about. I wonder like, who lives up on top there, because the bar downstairs, you could swim a cat. I mean, you can't. Uh, well, hopefully, whoever it is, they knew that going in. That's my favorite tag. But yeah. Um, yes, sir. Um, I'm interested in how. Tenants got along and actually survived before indoor plumbing was introduced. Mm -hmm. And I live in an apartment that was certainly a tenement uh, unit at one time because uh, uh, each room effectively has a decorative fireplace, and so that was functional before mm -hmm. in the 1900s when this building was built. So that was the source of heat. Mm -hmm. I'm also interested to learn. Uh, how some buildings still have water tanks mm -hmm. and, and others connected to municipal water mm -hmm. and that was introduced. Um, well, I can uh, give you some insight on some of that. So, you know, typically for these um, tenant houses when they were built, for, uh, none of them had, you know, uh, bathrooms in individual units. That really didn't start happening until uh, well into the 20th century. Um, so. Um, uh, the earliest ones would typically have an outhouse in the back, and amazingly, um, you know, a lot of those uh, back buildings that are in the and there's literally scores of them in the East Village started out as outhouses, um, and then when they eventually built um, bathrooms in the building, they just built up the outhouse and turned it into more apartments, um, which people don't like to know. Um, so um, the later tenements would have. Sometimes they would have, you know, a single water closet in the hallway. Sometimes it wouldn't even be a bathroom, it would just be like a, a spade. So it was a place where you could wash your hands or get water, but not go to the bathroom. Um, and then, of course, you know, the later ones had, you know, the famous bathtub in the kitchen. Um, so it really was an evolution over time, um, and a combination of city and state law would re over time require more and more of these amenities, certainly in new construction, and then oftentimes retroactively in terms of requiring them to be um, added. But, um, you know, we have a... Uh, um, in the what we call the South Village, so south of uh, Houston Street around Thompson Street, there were a series of uh, model tenements that were built by an Italian immigrant fraternal organization in 1915 that were meant to be, you know, sort of these wonderful, um, uh, better than you know anybody of those means could afford um, uh, types of places to live. And one of the great innovations was every apartment had a bathroom, in it. Um, and this was 1915. So, you know, that was still, and I, uh, in the early 90s, when I was working, when I started working for an elected official who represented this area, um, I went in to do some tenant organizing in a building in that area, um, and it still had um, uh, bathrooms in the hallways. So those existed in New York um, until relatively recently. Um, and your second question was oh, water tanks on water tank building rooftops. Yeah, I know a little bit less about how that uh, works. Like why why some no longer need their water tanks and, and others don't. Sorry about that. Um, any other questions? We yes. live in a we live in a tenement, and um, now it's 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 a one apartment, mm -hmm. you know, room per floor, but it's got two doors. Mm -hmm. My question is, was it, 
it originally to two apartments mm -hmm. that they later made into one big apartment? It really depends. Um, certainly most older tenements, the interiors have been uh, changed over time. Um, so it's rare that they're in their original configuration. Um, you can look it up on here yourself and you might be able to figure it out. You can also feel free to email me with the address and I'd be happy to do a little exploring and see if I can find out for you. Um, I used to, before I lived where I live now, I lived in a, a tenement and um, it was four apartments per floor. But it, uh, my understanding was when it was originally built, it was two railroads per floor. Yeah. So sometimes, believe it or not, as they get updated, they actually chop them up smaller. <clears throat> so it's, it's, you would think it would be the reverse, but that's because when they were built, they were built for Love families family. of 20. Yeah. Yeah. And then at a certain point, there were no families of 20 that were gonna live there anymore, so they chopped them up into like very small for singles, couples, roommates. It just kind of confuses me because all the other ones have two doors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And two doors in one apartment makes no sense. Get in touch with me, let me know the address, and I'll, I'll see if I can help you figure it out. Like the, the the light light. I guess that's like, interesting. So, um, the uh, dry dock district, is that the original name or is that a designation of Soho? No, that was the original name. In fact, it, it rarely, rarely hear it used anymore, although there's a playground over there that's called the Dry Dock uh, Playground. Um, but yes, that was the name, and it was uh, Dry Docks because uh, it was a, sort of a, an innovative thing where the boats would come in and they could be lifted up out of the water for work to be done on them. So that's why it was called the Dry Dock uh, District, and there used to be a Dry Dock Savings Bank. Yes, and you did about 10th Street. Yes, yes. Um, and so that's where that name comes from. Any other questions? Um, so this is another question. Um, so I, I'm fascinated with this idea that a large building was built around a small house. Because mm -hmm. nowadays you sometimes see a house and the, the owner won't leave, like Midtown, mm -hmm. and the building is kind of visibly built around mm -hmm. So in the case of instances you were speaking of, are there any sort of eccentricities in apartments in the larger resultant building, which might indicate that it had been part of a small house? Sure, it, it, it can be. Um, you know, it, it really depends. Um, and, while, and what would, might one look for? Do you have any idea? Uh, well, so, I wish I could uh, show it to you, but I know in Midtown, among other places, and I'm just having to be thinking of ones in Midtown, it's very easy, at least, for me, because I have sort of background in this, I can see buildings where I'm like, oh, that was a house, and they added a front to it, and they added a story on top. You can sort of okay. tell by looking at it. Now, in most cases, I've never been on the inside, so it's hard for me right. to know what that translates yeah. into. And, you know, over time, it, it may be that originally it was, um, you know, you can see it, it. It's not that dissimilar to when people add, like, a, a tea porch or a rear addition to one of mm -hmm. these kinds of buildings. It's just, it's another room right, sort right. of behind it. So they might have started out that way, and then over time, they might have done a, a complete gut on the inside, and almost no trace of what was originally there was left. So it, it really depends. It's, it, it will vary from, from building to building. Um, but it's fascinating. How yeah, because you you're dividing up a house, so part of the upper story goes to this apartment, and the lower story goes to that apartment. Anyway. Each, each, yeah, one, it's, each one is it's different. It's a weird problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Um, you had shown a building where the cornice has been taken off. Yes. Does that happen a lot to avoid repairing them or whatever? Yeah, so, you know, we've all heard of the, the law of unintended consequences. So, um, some of you may remember in, in 1980, there was a, a tragic situation with a, a woman who was killed by a piece of falling ornament that fell off of a building, uh, a Barnard building, so uh, up in Morningside Heights. So, as a result of that, the city passed a law that said that all property owners had to have the uh, uh, the exteriors of their buildings um, inspected every five years to make sure that ornament and exterior detail were in adequate shape and if not make repairs and it was very very well intentioned you don't want these things falling and killing people or hurting people um, unfortunately what some property owners said was I'm just going to chop it off because I don't want to have to deal with that so that's part of the reason why since around 1980 not that this didn't happen before 1980 but there's been a real acceleration of that because we now have a sort of legally mandated responsibility to check and repair 
that sort of stuff. Now that one on the uh, uh, Fifth Street and Avenue B um, certainly looked like it was in great condition to me, but even just getting it checked and repaired, uh, even just getting it checked every five years, there's an expense attached to it. So I'm guessing that the owner decided that eh, I'll just, you know, it'll cost me a few bucks to chop it off, but then I don't have to get these inspections. What he or she may not realize is those cornices have a practical value as well, which is that they help protect the facade. Um, so he's, in a sense, cutting off his nose to spite his face um, without realizing it. So. You would think it would be more common that somebody would have a, a, a pot of clay come out of the window, fall out of the window. Or, or now I, I experienced this, well, not, not that, I experienced um, the people who were. Uh, uh, the work with the air conditioner, they want to take it out for the winter or they want to school it for the spring or the summer. I can easily pull out of the window. So you would think that type of thing, something coming out of the window, or a lens or a fire escape. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different kinds of dangers, and that's why there's rules about what you can and can't keep on fire escapes, which not all of us always abide by. Right. That's a whole other story. So, yeah. I wanted to say something about the masonry in the Willsburg, because I read that uh, the first in, uh, first generation in Willsburg did some beautiful masonry and road work in the tenements so that their people could have the elegance of the bridge. And like, masonry was done by the Italian immigrants mm -hmm. and the grill work by the Irish immigrants. Do you know anything? Well, I know that, you know, certainly there are different ethnic groups often tended to uh, congregate in certain industries and, and right. definitely uh, Italian immigrants in the buildings trade were very, so there were certainly a lot of artisans who were of Italian heritage. Um, but, you know, if you look at, for instance, the, um, the, the German tenements in this neighborhood, they're unbelievably rich detail. Um, I mean, and, and if you look at the ones on the Lower East Side that we built for Jewish immigrants, so, you know, some of them are more plain, some of them are more lavish. There, there are certain kinds of detailing that tended to draw on certain traditions, but more often than not, it actually was reflective in some way of the sort of the trends of the time. Um, if you look at the buildings, um, while sometimes you can say, oh, this is sort of Germanic, um, you can also definitely say, this is very 1870s, like th this is what was going on during that time period. Um, so I think there's probably elements of each uh, to it. Um, last question, yes. Um, of the buildings that you've lost over, say, the past decade, which one were you the most disappointed in? Sorry, just to end on a really sad note. <laughs> 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 Bring us back to reality. Uh, a, no, that's a really good question. Yeah. You know, there's one, it's funny, I, I'll, because I actually I wrote a piece about this on our, on our blog. Um, so there was a building in what we also call the South Village called the Tunnel Garage. Um, yeah, which was on Broom Street and Thompson Street, um, and it was this unbelievably um, uh, poetically beautiful parking garage mm -hmm. um, that was built in the 1920s in the earliest uh, parts of the automobile era. Um, it had this beautiful medallion of a Model T Ford up on top of it. It had this like wonderful uh, graphic lettering, streamlined design. It was sort of Art Deco before, even a little bit before Art Deco really existed. Um, and it could have so easily been um, reused, but a developer bought it and just decided, I'd rather just tear it down and build something new in its place. Um, so if for whatever reason you're interested in uh, seeing pictures of it and knowing more about the story, we have a whole uh, piece on our website. If you just uh, go to our website and just search for Tunnel Garage or Model T, it's pretty much the only thing that'll come up if you Google Model T on our website. There's a whole lovely story and some really, really great um, pictures. Um, you have been a wonderful audience. I really appreciate you. you listening and your, your wonderful questions. Um, I just want to encourage everybody, pick up some of our information on the way out, pick up some of Little Mish's information on the way out, sign a petition about trying to get um, landmark protections extended um, in the East Village, and um, keep in touch with us because we need you in order to, to make this work. So thank you so much. Thank you.